Hey there. Welcome to another episode of the Game Master Soapbox. I'm Jonathan Albin, also known as Game Master J, and we are today covering, as usual, a uh, plethora of subjects, and so uh, we'll just like, hop right into it. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about a new event that's going to be starting, well, we posted one in a row. <laughs> I suppose that's a, a trend. But uh, on second Saturdays of each month, we're going to be uh, opening up a new role play event live at the uh, Board Games Paradise store, one of my sponsors, whose logo is right down there in the corner. Uh, Board Games Paradise in Redlands, California on State Street is a premier game store in uh, the Redlands, California area. Um, and on Saturdays, once a month, I get the opportunity to run uh, an event called Role Play Roulette. It's a kind of a new way to look at role play games. We utilize a game system that's called uh, Playground that I developed a while ago. And it's a diceless uh, decision-making role play game uh, in a variety of genres, the, hence the term roulette, is a, uh, like the rotisserie barrel of a, of a roulette table. Pardon me. We have uh, t uh, about 20 different genre, and uh, when the, the day of the game, game comes, we activate the wheel and it spins around and around and around and provides us with a random generated uh, genre. One of 20 different ones that I've uh, submitted into the wheel. And we play that role play uh, mechanism, that role play uh, genre. And they vary wildly from post-apocalyptic uh, encounters to uh, modern day detectives to gritty 1930s film noir to uh, gothic monster horror and things like that and so therefore it's a it's a wide ranging game but the the attractive part of it is that if you've never played a role play game at all if you've never had the opportunity to engage in role play it's a great way to learn the fundamental basic mechanics and the structure of how a role play game might go without having the burden of having to spend hours to learn, learning how a game mechanism works. It simply is just like we would be if we were playing in the playground, the opportunity for everybody to take up a role and uh, make believe for a little while. So that's on Saturdays. It will be at, if I recall, if I recall correctly, it's a Saturday afternoons uh, uh, on the second Saturday of the month at uh, 6 p.m. at the store in Midlands. Uh, for more information, Contact Board Game Paradise uh, via their website, boardgameparadise.com, or the uh, Facebook uh, for Board Game Paradise, or, of course, you can reach out to my website, Necos RPG, for more information as well. Uh, so, today, uh, the next uh, thing that we're going to be covering for the next 10 minutes would be the, uh, the do's and don'ts of dynamic dialogue like a little alliteration there to go with that all right so when you are involved in a role-playing game quite often there are situations that you get into where you as a player must communicate with a with one or more non-player characters and therefore the audience of the game which are the other players as well in an interaction of dialogue in other words you've got to actually talk to people or monsters or whatever the elements of di di of having a dynamic dialogue session uh, follows uh, the following precepts and the first one that you have to think about and, and remember is that when you are talking to the non-player character or whatever you're still talking to the game master and the first couple of times that you do it it will feel kind of odd because you're being put in an artificial situation wherein you're going to be initiating a conversation while you're already having conversation 
with the very same person, but now they're going to be in that singular or multiple roles, and that will make it a little bit more um, confusing and perhaps uh, make you feel a little silly. But So the first thing about being involved with that, therefore, is to uh, not and uh, not dissociate. Make sure you stay in the scene, in the mindset of the player while you're having the conversation and don't drift into what you yourself might be thinking, but rather continue to operate and communicate from the standpoint of the character. Even uh, motion picture actors sometimes have difficulty with holding on to the dynamic role because that that, that specific scene and that specific thing does require an amount of uh, energy to create and therefore maintain. Uh, so don't feel like you're, uh, a, so you should feel like you are experiencing it as that person and uh, do not uh, do confuse your role with who you are or recall your role with, with what's going on in the scene by staying within the character and staying within your uh, set descriptors for who you are or whatever, it will be helpful and it will be easier to uh, convince, con convey information in that role, as that role. The second thing to consider when dealing with a dialogue situation is that Although you are in a, for example, in a role play environment, you're in a room with other players, the conversation that is going on, as established, is intentionally between you and one or one or more characters in that in that scene. So be clear about to whom you are speaking and what your subject matter is. Therefore, you can convey. As, uh, as, as little information as you need to to get additional information from the storyteller in that role. Again, when we're speaking of something that's happening in this third person methodology, when you're saying what a dialogue is like, it feels a little confusing because we're now talking about a separate set of circumstances where it would be uh, for example, myself as a game master and you as the character, your com your conversation would therefore be moderated or controlled by your ability to insert yourself in the role and to emote and, and respond as if you were that character in that moment. And the more intense that you can feel it and the more intense that you can express the information as the character instead of as you the player the more powerful the data will be the more interesting the information will be because it will be internalizing it and if you will owning that scene the next thing about the do's and don'ts of dialogue is that if you are going to take on an affected voice whether you want to cr create a sound that you expect your character to have maybe signature words and phrases that you've determined that your character would use, you have to make sure that you maintain those over the duration of the conversation. If you start off, for example, in a whiny, nasally voice, then you have to stay in the whiny, nasally voice for the duration of the conversation so that the other person can definitely feel that that nasal personality is who you are. That's like, that was an affectation. I, I don't actually uh, channel uh, Peter Lorre all the time. But the, the idea is that the personality and the affectations bring a level of realism to the scene and make it more intense and more realistic from the standpoint of experiencing a role-play game for all that it's worth. A dialogue between characters, therefore, is, is something that is separate from a conversation you might have with a storyteller about the scene. Instead of, instead of just simply expressing the, the raw 
rough details of the scene. We're therefore now experiencing the feelings that might be in that scene that wouldn't be necessarily readily visible, but can be definitely seen within the scene. So in the case of the nasally voice that I mentioned earlier, if you were having a conversation and a person who was speaking in that kind of voice said, well, guys, I understand there's nothing wrong with what I'm talking about right now. I definitely, definitely have a handle on the situation. That voice itself adds inflection and makes you wonder or doubt whether or not there's sincerity behind the words. And that can be an, intent, an intentional thing, or it could be a red herring distraction. But you as the storyteller, you as the player in that scene, have to kind of get a handle on which it is at that moment. All right. So now when you're, when you're dealing with the uh, do's and don'ts of dialogue, the next thing to realize is that it, your conversation should be contained to the specifics of the information you intended to gather or covering the points that you as a player really wish to reveal and nothing more. Sometimes uh, the fun of being silly or being different with your tonality and your, your, your terms can lead you to lose focus on what your the conversation is about and therefore begin to lose the value of doing a voiced scene. And cause yourself to lose a, a grip, if you will, on what was important about having the conversation in the first place. I can't tell you how many times I've had a player in game simply become so fascinated with the conversation and the sound of it and the, the nuances of the persona and the character that I'm portraying in the, uh, in the dialogue that they forget what they were initially talking about and don't even ask the questions that they came there to deal with, or they don't remember what information they were trying to gather in the first place. And then when we're you know, 20 minutes into the conversation, other players are like, come on, let's get to the point. What is it you're trying to do? And that breaks that, that, that dynamic tension that was being built into the scene. So be careful that you, if nothing else, keep notes on what you're talking about in, the, in that scene to make sure that you stay on task for what you are going to be needing to gather from that NPC. Another aspect of a dynamic dialogue that becomes important is the fascination with the persona that's being developed that you don't lose sight of what the original reason for the conversation is and that you give too much information away. I have a very good friend of mine who whenever she plays a role play game, the rest of the players kind of ride herd on her in the conversations because she gets so into the role of her persona that she's literally listening to the sound of her own voice and she enjoys doing it to the point where other players have to be uh, Jean, uh, excuse me, uh, dear, we're, we're, we're just got to get to the conversation here. We need to stay on task. Remember, you're looking for this information from the sheriff. So make sure that when you're talking to the sheriff, you get that information, you know. And what's, what makes a dialogue more useful, a, 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 a conversational dialogue, is that there are as many valuable pieces of information that can be gathered by the silences in the performance as they can be in the actual words that are being said. So when you are in a dialogue situation, be aware not only of what is what you're saying, what the other person is saying, but how it's being said, how is it being portrayed, uh, flowery language, uh, obfuscating terms, ambiguities, uh, uh, unwarranted precision. These are all mechanisms that can occur in a dynamic dialogue situation that are not there in a narrative, in a flat narrative. So 
um, another another don't in a dynamic dialogue is, dialogue is you don't want to get in a situation where you as the protagonist in the scene, and this whether you're a storyteller or a player, don't get in a situation where you as the protagonist are on the ropes, that you are playing into a conversation dynamically as a defend, defender rather than the uh, aggressor and attacker of the scene. The two-way conversation sometimes feels like you should give way to what is being said by the the other person in the conversation, but the purpose for that dialogue isn't merely to present the roles in a way that is believable, but to utilize that positioning to gather the information that you want from the scene. So uh, your dynamic dialogue scenes are very powerful and very useful. Make sure you just try to hold on to what you're trying to get out of it before you move on to other things within that conversation. Okay, I'll go on to my next point here. Uh, there is a power and there are problems with plot devices. And this old saw, this old thought process goes back for a really long time. If you have a situation in the scene that seems to be um, insurmountable, by your players that they, they, they feel like they're stuck against a rock and a hard place and they can't see their way out of the scene. There's a huge temptation to want to break that impasse by providing them with a quicker mechanism, a shortcut, if you will, through the use of a plot device. And to be clear, a plot device is any mechanism or persona that the game master provides the players with that literally short circuits the role play of the scene. Role play, of course, is the whole idea of getting to be your character, get to think like your character, get to act like your character, make decisions like your character. And when a storyteller gets to the point where he's provided information and he's waiting for a decision from from the adventurers and from the group, there's a tendency to despise the silence that can come once all expository data has been provided. It's important as a storyteller to recognize the moments when that occurs that there is still activity going on in the minds of the players and that you as a game master don't have to be the problem solver. You're creating the problems, you're creating the situation for the players to make decisions about, then you have to let them make decisions. Uh, uh, most notably in, most con in, in role play conditions is uh, uh, the concept of a plot device called deus ex machina. And, Literally, the phrase means God in a box or God from the machine. And the reason for Deus Ex Machina is that there are times in a story where there is no way out. And it was, it'll was it only be an external, external agency provided by the storyteller that lets the players off the hook, if you will. It makes them... Uh, no longer need to twist in their own indecision. So it's a powerful tool. It's a very effective tool. Um, and Deus Ex Machina is only one of many plot devices. Uh, dis misdirection, uh, secondary sources, uh, uh, Mary Janes, and so on. There's, there's so many different ways that a storyteller can relieve the tension in a scene that you have to kind of learn the nuances of just letting that power set in the hands of the players and let them actually work through what they are collectively going to do. A big methodology for that would be when you as a storyteller have finished your expo exposition, you've given them everything that they need to, you believe, to make the decision. 
it's really si difficult sometimes to sit with silence but actually that that it's like uh uh in, in, in blues music, uh, I think it's Miles Davis said that uh, you don't play just the notes, you play the silences as well. The utility of that pregnant pause after you've leveled all of the information that's necessary for a decision to be made, the nuance and power of that is that you get to see how the mind of your players work and then how they can get past the difficulty by embracing all the variables and sitting and letting their minds process everything that's been afforded. Now, it's perfectly fine and not a plot device at all for you as a game master to urge the players to make a decision. Um, you've got something yet? Uh, there's something going on in there? What are you guys thinking? You know, those are not plot devices. Those are uh, prompts, but they're not uh, what I'm speak speaking to. A plot device in particular is something that happens that the where the storyteller lets them off the hook. So, for example, if they are in a place and somebody has made a uh, in-story threat to the establishment and is looking for the players to... Um, shoot or to act or get you know or get out of the way the moment of truth there is poignant and powerful and should not be diffused by the storyteller the the, the if you set all the pieces in place and you've given them all the information you have to wait for them to make the decision and it's it's really fun actually when you when you're a storyteller when you get to see their actual uh, gymnastics. And so I often will prompt the players to talk to each other. I'll say, hey, you know, you're, you're in this situation and these are the environmental keys and here are your expositional triggers that I just re restated for you. So what is your action? Matter of fact, what are you going to do is one of my favorite phases as a game master. You know, I, I tell you what we're doing and what's going on in the room and now you tell me what you're gonna do. I don't know how uh, difficult that short si silence there was to deal with, but I know that uh, in radio and other uh, media like podcasts, a period of dead airtime is, is dangerous. It's not you know, comfortable and it leaves uncertainty. And so there's a reason to want so badly to continue to talk and your, your desire to get through the scene sometimes pushes you to be eager to interrupt yourself and provide the, the players with a way out um, through something that happens mechanically that you've provided them with. But the danger, the problem with, with a plot device uh, when you improperly or, or too, uh, too in, um, eagerly used is that your players start to doubt when they are to make a decision whether or not they're going to be given permission because sometimes the establishment of a plot device literally diffuses the situation and takes away from the player's decision making process and we want to make sure instead that we're giving the player every opportunity to solve the problem and fix the situation and make a decision All right, so we're now going to go into, I've been calling it my one minute rant, but I realized in the last two episodes, I'm not able to do it in, in a minute. 60 seconds is not enough to cover the information. And so today, although I'm sick, this will be the last time I actually listed as the one minute rant, I am just going to call it a uh, daily rant. Uh, today's one minute rant, and uh, I'm gonna set the clock, but I don't think I'll be able to stick to it. That's been a challenge. But I want to uh, gripe about or complain about the concept of a player character's backstory. All right. Looking at the clock and waiting. 
Alrighty, so a character's backstory absolutely is one of the most difficult challenges in carrying a role play game to fruition, even in the very first session. The concepts that were devised when Dungeons and Dragons added the particular character backstory elements is that they were trying to short circuit something that had been historically a problem for role play games and that was getting the group getting the band back together so to speak the idea of bringing players from disparate backgrounds into the same setting and having explanations for why they are there that are believable and understandable in a short burst of information was completely subverted by the utilization of the background to explain away the skills bases that the characters have in the scene. And it's absolutely untenable to let the backstory carry all of that water, so to speak, for your story and not have a, have a say in it as a game master. All right, so that, that's my 60 seconds and I still got so much more to say. So let's just continue on the subject. So a character's backstory, generally speaking, how it carries within it the elements of utility, the elements of purpose, the elements of even family or background that make the player character something that you want to learn about. And it, while it sounds really attractive to be able to say on you know two or three sentences the background of a particular persona. It's really, really dangerous for a storyteller to grant so much agency to a player without at least some feedback to the scenes. As a matter of fact, in, in my case, when a role play group comes together, the background by necessity needs to be something that is massaged into the story between the game master and the players to make sure that not only is it a believable backstory, but that there's a sufficient hooks and uh, rough spots in the story that the game master can sink his hooks into the story, in, into the character's background to make the character part of the overall story. That concept is completely lost on most players in today's world because they see the backstory as the framework for the direction they want to take the character pardon me moving forward they want to see the backstory literally as the what happened yesterday what happened a week ago what happened a month ago so that the feeling of the character to them is complete and that ironically is one of the greatest challenges of having a backstory is that you don't want a character that is complete. You don't want a nice, smooth backstory where you fill in all the question answers together right there. Instead, you want to leave a whole lot of mystery and a whole lot of wonder and a whole lot of curiosity about the character so that at once he's easy to integrate into the story because pieces of his backstory actually are involved in the game or by making the information that is palatable to the player also fits into the dynamic of the story that the game master wants to tell and i know i'm going to get flack for that i know there are people who absolutely look at a game master's role and see him as an adjudicator and judge and um, administrator without uh, the uh, tutorial portion there's no there's no need for a game master to tell a story if he's simply going to be being a lawgiver for the players as they live out their sandbox reality. But there's there's more to it than that in a game master's position. And I believe that we have had a probably half a decade now of people overly enthusiastic about denying uh, the game master that, that, that purpose. Instead, they, we want to paint him into a corner and say, no, you're the CPU. You're just the operational system. You're, you're, you're only here to make sure that all the rules are followed. And that's, that's so binding, so, so limiting to what a storyteller can bring to the game that I, I just, 
it's it's a bugaboo for me and uh we, we, we will see in the future why that's the case and uh in another uh, episode perhaps i'll go into my solution to the backstory problem and how to avoid it but for now just know that i'm it drives me crazy you want you want you want to have a crazy game master build a nice smooth self-contained instantly uh limiting backstory that, that, that'll do it all right um when you are in in a situation that if I like I realize I've, I've got I actually got done with the rant faster than I thought of but not nearly within one minute so uh, to continue therefore the way to handle a backstory properly is to have a question and answer session session many times the way I will present it is that the persona that I take on in asking that as a game master asking the, the character to explain to me their background is that I first of all require them to speak in that person as first person and not as well one of my character would has as their background I say well, what do you, what's your background what do you how are you coming to the table as a, as a uh, character explain it to me if you've got a voice great utilize your character voice in that response if you don't have a voice don't worry about it it will either either will come to you or things that you say will become the catchphrases. So don't feel like you have to be cleverly, cleverly witty at the beginning because we don't even know who you are. So let's just talk about it that way. Second thing is that I say, we are not talking about this from what you're reading on a piece of paper. So feel free to read your notes, but I want to you, can, you to be eye to eye with me. I want to hear your voice and see what you're saying so that I can feel that outcome from you. Because when we talk eye to eye, and we share information face to face it's so much more powerful and binding to our personalities inside the game that we understand each other more clearly um, the next thing about a character backstory is it's okay to say I don't know it's okay to leave things open you know sometimes you don't know how you came to be in town maybe you're not familiar with what the uh, bar was fixing for dinner last night maybe you're you don't know whether or not you're on a coaster or whatever it's okay to leave those pieces open because by doing so you're providing this the, the storyteller game master ways to bring you in and, and attach you to the story and therefore make your experience with the game much more personal and enjoyable <coughs> pardon me Conversely, if you've got a nice, solid background that you feel is really, really important to the story, don't give up on those points, but instead think about how you can ask a question of the storyteller that will help break that up. Because let's say you've got a really great, smooth background on how you just came across on a, on a, on a fishing vessel. You didn't know the crew. You've gotten into town but you've got you got beat up last night or you're you're starting starting with the idea of the been a recent fight ask the storyteller how did i get in the fight uh, i don't you know if this is fuzzy to me or it's not clear or even if it is clear what i intend push back on the storyteller say what is it how is it this can can work with your story how how is it that i'm you know got my back up against the wall about uh, things when talking to the, to the Grundum. Maybe what, what it makes my relationship with the Trelorans so tenuous. Uh, maybe you can give me some information on religion backgrounds or whatever to make it so that I can, can embrace who this person is. And this happens in, in uh, character development in motion pictures all the time. The idea that you are going to be playing a role to what are you bringing to the role? What are you fulfilling in the story that is only uniquely from your standpoint as the character you know this is critically important to realize that this engine that is a role play game is a two-way communication it's not just entertainment it's not just somebody painting on the canvas and we're watching the development instead we are the the paint and the brushes if you will we are the landscape itself and so therefore when we are 
taking on that role. As a player, we have to be open to what the story is doing and being aware of how it might infl infl influence us. But we shouldn't be restricting our process to what can or could not happen, what may or may not happen, what, what may have happened in the past, but instead be open to what might happen in the future. Alrighty, so we're coming up on the end of the show here. I do want to take some time to talk about the uh, open Twitch experiment, uh, the RPG experiment that we're going to be doing Saturday mornings uh, starting this week at 10 a.m. on uh, Twitch right here. I'm going to be operating a Twitch RPG wherein the players are not people sitting in a studio someplace with headphones and microphones. Instead, it's going to be dirty, dirty, muddy water where you as viewers get the opportunity to play in the game by submitting comments into the chat that then become part of the answers to the story as we move forward. Uh, if you have experience in role-play games, this is an opportunity for you to vicariously, through text, provide responses to what's going on in the game that will be embraced by myself as the storyteller and that collectively we as the audience and, and the uh, persons on screen will be able to uh, tell a deeper story and theoretically be able to run that uh, dynamic uh, to uh, its ultimate potential. I envision that uh, since it will be operating through the text methodology I'll be able to keep up with any texts that are posted and we'll be able to drive the story forward over time by simply uh, making recommendations for the actions within the game. We will be doing a uh, Saturday morning uh, session zero this, this coming Saturday. We will be talking about the uh, Dark Shard setting in particular, the fantasy setting that we're going to be using and how decisions will be made both in the short and the long term now if you are enjoying the show i'd like to ask you at this point to go ahead and click the like button uh, subscribe and uh, make sure you click on the notifications bell to make sure that you get info updates on every new set uh, uh, material that we put out but uh, if you're if you're viewing this show and you, you're not enjoying the content uh, i appreciate the time that you have spent and sure, leave me a comment. Let me know what I can do better because this is an ongoing process. I've, I've made several different tries to get, to get information out there, but this I found to be a pr pretty uh, strong way to convey that information so that you, you as the viewers can get back from the event, in, the event information. Now, I do want to mention that we will be affording the opportunity for those persons who back the pro program uh, at patreon.com slash Nikos. At the $20 value, you'll be able to actually become a participant on the show. We will provide you with access to our Discord channel. And those who are, uh, as I said, paid members and, and, and so desire will be able to join us on the Discord in our voice chat, which will be included in the conversation as an audio voice for the audience as well so uh, feel free to uh, become a participant at that level for that and then we will embrace as many players as we get in the game mechanism for as long as we can at some point we may have to cap it but the idea here is to make it as open as possible and as, as uh, inclusive as possible so that you as viewers get to learn the experience of being a role play gamer in a game even as it's going on live on screen. So that will be at this channel at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific time here on Nikos RPG. So thank you very much for your attendance today. Uh, I, if, I, if there was somebody in the viewing audience that ever has any questions, feel free to post them in our chat. I do read all the chats as, and, and make sure that I am, uh, respond to them as, as rapidly as I can. If you can't uh, be on during the actual show and want to leave a comment, make sure you do so in the comment section. 
and I will respond to those as, uh, as quickly as I can. Thank you so much for your attendance today, and uh, I will now get off of my soapbox and get back to playing the games. So have a great weekend.